morning, church. Wet one out there today. I think Roxanne said that. Um, <clears throat> just want to talk a little bit about the kids out in Colorado. I know I mentioned this a few weeks ago, or last, I think they left last sa Sunday. Anyway, they come back next Saturday, so they're out there for two weeks, and they've had 29 classes so far. Each class is 45 minutes long. So pastor talked with the kids a little bit uh, the other day, and, and they said that um, they didn't complain about how long the classes were, how many classes they had, but they talked about which ones they liked the best. So that's, that's pretty encouraging. I'm hoping that they all come back on fire for the Lord and just have some great stories to share with us. Um, that being said, let us... Thank you so much, worship team. I was uh, with a family yesterday uh, planning a funeral, and uh, they asked Kathy to do the music, and they just went on and on about what a wonderful job she did just six months ago at another funeral that they had in their family. So we have a, we have a real gift in our church of, of musical talent. Thank you, Kathy, for all you do, and all of the worship team. That last song uh, was very meaningful to me at a time in my life when I was going through a, just a dark time, and I really appreciate the power of music in our lives. Captain Shaw was a medical doctor and a member of the Salvation Army and went as a missionary to India to operate a leper colony. And so as he came in and took charge of this Place, uh, he noticed three men who were in chains. They were patients, but they were also criminals. And he saw how the chains on their wrists and their ankles were cutting into the skin and making their suffering all the more terrible. And so he asked the guard to remove the chains. And the guard said, no, he said, That's, um, they're criminals. That's not safe. He said, I'll take responsibility, give me the key. And he unlocked the shackles from their wrists, knelt down and, and did their ankles. And then he bandaged them up and treated them. And he could see in their eyes that they were relieved. And he felt like they were grateful. And he was glad he took a chance on them. Things were fine after that. But two weeks later, he, he was kind of wondering because something came up and he had to leave the colony and be gone overnight. He had a wife and a young son that would have to stay, and he was reluctant to leave them there. But his wife said, you go, God is here, we'll be safe. And so he did go, and um, his wife was fine, but she was surprised the next morning when she woke up and went to the front door to find those three men sleeping right outside her door. And they said, we just came to make sure you'd be safe all night. That doctor didn't know how they would respond. He might have thought they would be loyal to him if he was kind to them, but maybe not. This funeral that I'm going to do next week, uh, the daughter asked me to share something that Grandpa always said to his kids and his grandkids. And it was this. If you treat them right, they'll treat you right. And that was just sort of a blanket thing in his life. If you treat them right, they'll treat you right. And that's generally true, isn't it? It's not always true, though, is it? Sometimes they'll stab you in the back, those rascals. And, uh, but th there is that principle. Well, if this doctor had thought, if I treat them right, they'll treat me right, that would have been uh, not so much an act of courage or even love. It would have maybe been more like manipulation. I'll, I'll just kind of tinker with this and get the results I want. But he didn't know how they would respond. He didn't know if it would work out. He gave them the gift of trust, and it came out of the gift of love. He loved them. Love is powerful. It's huge. It changes the world. It's, it's the nature of God. And when it's set loose inside us, and through us, it makes a huge difference. Can't be measured. 
When love can be rejected, love can be ignored. And so God wants us to receive it. And Jesus Christ is, has given the ultimate gift of love. If you want to know what love looks like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to love, look at what he did. The Bible says when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. He died for us. He died in our place. He came to set us free from the deadly effects and results of our sins. He came to remove the shackles from us. We couldn't demand that they be removed. We could only hope someone would have mercy. And he took the punishment we deserve. And today on Sunday, hundreds of millions of people have gathered in groups like us to worship him all around the world. Any language you can think of, any culture you might be in, any age group, any part of the world, there are hundreds of millions of people worshiping him. More people worship him on a Sunday than watch NFL football or whatever you want to name, while they're at human events. Worship is huge. It doesn't get talked about in the news as much, but it's huge. It's changing lives. And here, another thing, as a result of worshiping Jesus today, in the week of head, ahead, hundreds of millions of actions will be taken that show mercy and kindness to others. There are Christians who have to meet in secret because it's dangerous. There are Christians who don't have much materially. There are Christians who don't know much biblically. But the one difference Jesus makes in all of us is we act out our relationship with him by loving the people around us. The Bible says we love because God first loved us. We love God because he loved us first. We love other people because God has loved us. And so God gave us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now it's not talking about God's brother. He doesn't have a brother. It's talking about your brother and my brother. And it's not just brothers, it's sisters. It's not just physical brothers. It's anybody that God has brought alongside us in life. God tells us, love those around you. He wants us to let his love flow into us freely so it can freely flow out of us and touch the people and benefit the people around us. Now we know God doesn't love us because we're too adorable for him not to. We can be pretty decent people. We clean up pretty nicely on a Sunday. But we can be annoying and we can be hurtful and we're sinners by nature. And so we need God to work in us. Whenever we indulge ourselves in self-centeredness, we actually are defying God. We're rebelling against our creator. He didn't make us for that. And we actually look at other people more as competitors than as companions on this journey that we're in. We want what we want. And we have to resist that and fight that and defy that over and over. God made us to be loving. If you go to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, you'll see he talks there about you don't have because you don't ask, and you don't ask because your motives are wrong. Your, your world revolves around you, and that makes you an enemy of God. We don't want that. We don't want to do damage. We've already done enough. We need a Savior, and we need him to be in charge, don't we? Now, God doesn't have to save us. God could look at the world that we've messed up. God could look at our lives that we've messed up, and he could just walk away. He could say, well, they made their choice. But he won't, because he wants to save us. The Father has done everything needed to bring us back into his family and into his, fa into his plan. And if we let him, he'll do it. But even though we eagerly should welcome God, to be in charge, we can walk away too, can't we? We can walk away from him, and people do. It breaks his heart, but he 
gave us moral freedom. We can make choices, and, and he won't interfere. He won't walk away. He won't stop inviting us back, but he will let us make the stupidest decision we want to. And we all know it because we've done some of it, haven't we? Our creator made us to love us. He made us for a life of purpose. He made us to have fullness in life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full or more abundantly. He's not talking about making us all rich. He's not making, talking about making our lives easy. He's saying, I want you to have such a meaning in your life. I want you to have such purpose. I want you to live in such a way that life is full for you. And he does. He'll make us what we're meant to be. And when we cooperate with him, when we let his incredible love penetrate us, we become new people. His love flows in and it flows right through us to touch others. And we don't have to worry about it running out because God's love never runs out. And so we can let it run into us and out through us over and over. It'll never come up short. And Jesus told us there are two types of people we need to be intentional about loving. We need to love everybody. There's no, nobody left out of that. But there's two groups that we easily could think, well, not them. And the first one is the least of these. Jesus told a story at the final judgment of how he will say to some people, come, you who are blessed by my Father. And they say, what, us? He says, yes, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. And he goes on in the story to explain what he means by the least of these. It's people who can't pay us back for helping them. It's people that it's easy for us to overlook. It's people who may keep to themselves, but they have all kinds of needs. Many times they're barely getting by, physically or emotionally or financially, and they have no way to pay anybody back who, who gives them a helping hand. And in this passage, Jesus mentions specific kinds of needs that folks may have. He talks about people who, who need food, people who are thirsty, people who don't have enough clothes, people who lack shelter, people who have health issues and need care, folks who are in jail and there's no one to care. He's talking about folks who are hanging on one day at a time. And he says, it means a great deal to him when we reach out to one of them and show them the kindness that they need. Mother Teresa uh, taught her uh, volunteers who worked with her, every time you reach out and touch a hurting person, you're touching Jesus. Every person that comes in need of our care, we treat as if that person was Jesus. And Jesus says that's pretty much on the mark. But we can't do it. It's not in our nature. We run out of gas. We need to draw on God's love to help people who can't pay us back. And he's pleased to work through us. He's pleased to use us if we'll let him. The Bible says not to turn away when we see a need. The Bible says to look for a chance to invest in someone's life. It says in Romans, share with God's people who are in need. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. One of the things I've come to appreciate about Crane Chapel has been going on all the way back to the beginning, far longer than I knew there was a church here is that this is a church that welcomes people of all kinds. This is a church where nobody has to meet some kind of expectation. They have to measure up before they're welcome here, before they can be part of the church. People come sometimes with great needs and they're loved and they're welcomed. And our church doesn't do everything, but it has found ways to minister and to serve people. When I met with a family this week, I was able to say, well, you could have that service, that funeral at Crane Chapel. And I knew 
that I was safe to do that because we have women in our church who will come, who will serve, who will bring cakes, who will show love, who will look out at the family and see if there's someone they know and go over and, and talk with them and show kindness to them. They won't just plop something on a plate. They'll dish out love as well as food. We have a wonderful group of people here who do that over and over again, often for families where they don't know a soul and they've never been inside our church except for the last funeral. And yet that's the kind of love that God has called us to show when people have needs. Sometimes people financially just are trying to figure out how they're even going to pay for it. And our church has done all that they can to make it as easy and as dignified as possible. Thank you for being part of Crane Chapel. Thank you for being part of God's love being expressed. We built this beautiful building, this wonderful, useful building, and then we invite kids in. For Vacation Bible School, they'll spend the whole week here. It might be raining out. And they'll come in with the mud on their shoes. And nobody is worried about the cleanliness of the building. Nobody's worried about another mark on a wall or a stain on a carpet. We take care of our building. It's, it's kept up. We have people who come every week to clean. Uh, Donnie Hall is here a couple times a week. During vacation Bible school, he'll be here every day just cleaning up. And he does it with a smile because kids came and made that mess. And they're learning about Jesus. And some of them will be in heaven because of our love. I appreciate that about this church. We're not a museum. We're a hospital. We're a school. We're not a museum. Aren't you glad to be part of something like that? There's life here. There's life here. And God loves it. And he wants to bless us and guide us. He wants to show us the next thing that we can do. Here's another thing about suffering is that you learn a lot when you suffer. If you're willing, if you're teachable, if you're reaching out to God, if you really have to depend on God, if you don't know what you're going to do next, but you're just counting on God to come through and show you and provide for you, you learn something about the, the nature of God. You learn something about the father, fatherhood of God that you don't learn in good times. And you can learn a lot from somebody who is in need, someone who is suffering, someone who has learned to hang on, someone who knows what it means when the Bible says we live by faith. And we all need that. And the truth is, we're not that far from being the next person who's having to live by that faith. I got a call to visit someone in a nursing home that I had met, and, and uh, they said, would you go see so-and-so? And so I went, and, and I got to the room, and he wasn't there. And so I asked, I said, well, where, where would he be? They said, oh, he's probably playing bingo. He's probably over in that room over there. So I went down over there, and he wasn't in there. I said, is this the bingo room? They said, yeah, we finished. I said, well, I'm looking for so-and-so. Oh, he probably went down. There's another bingo that's in the other end of the building. And sure enough, there he was. Uh, and uh, active, um, out there. But uh, got a call a week later that he had fallen. And uh, dying, he was dying. And he did. Our lives can change. We can be the one who is the least of these when yesterday we were doing fine. But we lose our job or our health fails or, or something else goes wrong and all of a sudden uh, the supply chain is broken in our individual situation and we need friends. And so the Bible tells us let God show us how to love one another. And let's make a point of loving those who need a friend. And there, there are folks in our town who maybe nobody knows their name. And nobody knows their need. And God says, will you love them? Will you watch for them? Will you reach out to them? There are folks that we'll encounter. They might be a cashier. They might be a neighbor. They might be out looking for a lost dog. But there are people that we will encounter who are wondering if they even should keep on living. And someone who shows kindness can give them hope. 
We can be those people, and we are. But let's do, let's be diligent, as the Bible tells us. Let's watch for those needs, those situations. Let's be the person God shares his love through. So love the least of these. There's another group. He doesn't use these words, but Jesus says we need to love the worst of these. I'm talking about somebody in your family or at work or in your neighborhood who just doesn't make life pleasant for you. There are people who wound us. There are people who belittle us. There are people who just ignore us. There are people who cheat us. There are people who harm us, sometimes just because they can. They treat us as if we were their enemy, and it's easy for us to come back and think of them as an enemy. In fact, uh, something in our gut goes off when they come around. We see them step into the room and something in us says, get out. They're not safe people. You treat them right, they don't treat you right back. There are dangerous people, there are hurtful people, and we need boundaries in our lives. We need to take care, of, we need to be safe. We need to say no, no, no in certain ways. But we also need to uh, be sure that we don't withdraw our heart, we don't despise someone, that we don't wish harm for someone, but that we love them back. The Bible says do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus is not asking us to do something he didn't do. He doesn't do. And here's the thing, you know, we said you can learn a lot from people who are hurting. You can learn a lot from people who are hurtful. You can learn a lot from people who make life harder for you. Not by some lecture they're going to give you, but by letting God speak into your life, letting God show you what he's up to. We can learn from those who cause us pain. They have no idea, but God is using them to make us more like Jesus. God is using them to give us wisdom. God is using them to give us perspective. God is using them to make us kinder. And God has allowed them in our life for some reason and when he did, he attached a blessing. And he said, okay, I'm going to let you into this person's life, but I am going to bring a blessing to them no matter what you want. And he does. Joseph, of course, is the great example. His brother sold him into slavery. He was sent down to Egypt, a foreign country, foreign language, foreign culture, a different religion, and he was a slave. And then he was thrown into prison. And all of these things happened, and they took years. Years went by. 22 years later, he's been promoted. He's in charge of Egypt. His brothers are hungry, and they come looking for food. And when they find out Joseph's in charge, they're scared to death. Here's his chance to get revenge. Here's his chance for justice. And Joseph says to them, don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of me. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who, who would have starved to death lived and did well because of Joseph's leadership, Joseph's insights, how God used him. And his, he was not mad at his brothers. He didn't say what they did was okay, that it was good. He said, God is good. And even when you do wrong, God will do right, and God will bring good, even when you mean harm, and he does. So we love people who don't love us. I got some ideas for this message from Mark Buchanan, a pastor in Canada, and he told a story that I want to share with you. The country of Rwanda in Africa went through a terrible civil war in the 90s. People killing their neighbors, people killing even relatives. It was one tribe against another, 
And if you ran into somebody from the wrong tribe, it could cost you your life. There was a, a period of insanity that lasted for about 100 days. And in that period, 800,000 people were murdered. 8,000 a day in this little country. People ran into the jungle and hid for months at a time to just stay away from danger. They didn't know who to trust. There were people who had gone to school together, people who had played on the same soccer team, people who lived in the same neighborhood who all of a sudden were killing one another. There were people who had married someone from the other tribe and even their murder took place. It was awful. And Rwanda is one of the nations in Africa where a large number of people have come to believe in Jesus. You say, what? Christians? But somehow they were swept into this river of hatred and greed and just stupidity. And it was awful. And one Christian woman lost her son. He was murdered. And she wasn't sure who did it. But she was determined to find out. She was consumed with anger, with bitterness. She wanted the guilty person to pay. And when, the, when, when calm finally came and justice was being, trying to, people were trying to figure out justice, she wanted that person. She was obsessed that that person needed to be found and needed to pay and needed to be punished. She wanted to find her son's killer. She was consumed with the need for justice. And it was ruining her life. One night she had a dream. She was walking down a street. She went by a house and somehow she knew that that house was where her enemy lived. Her enemy was the one who had killed her son. She didn't know who it was, but somehow she knew this is the house. And God was speaking to her, and God said, go into that house. No, God, I don't want to go into that house. Go into the house. She knew God. She knew his, his way of leading. She knew that he was always in charge, and, and she didn't want to obey, but she went into the house. Nobody was there. There was a stairway. And she sensed God saying, go up those stairs. No, Father, I don't want to go up those stairs. I'm not going up those stairs. You're going to go up those stairs. You need to go up those stairs. Listen to me. Go up the stairs. So she went up the stairs. There was a door. She opened the door. And she discovered that it led to heaven. It was a dream, but that door led to heaven. And when she woke up and she tried to figure out what's going on, she said, God was showing me that the path to his home leads through the home of my enemy. Now that's her experience. But the interesting thing is two days later, somebody was knocking on her door. She opened it and there stood a young man. He looked miserable, he may be trembling. And he blurted out to her his confession. I'm the one who killed your son. I don't know if they were schoolmates, I don't know anything about, but he knew where she lived. And he said, I, uh, I place my life in your hands. You can do with me whatever you want to. I've had no peace since that day and I will accept whatever you say. He was consumed with guilt. He said, if you want to kill me, you can. If you want to call the police, you can. I've come to place myself in your hands. And she knew that God had prepared her for this that that dream was about this, that God had a plan now. And she looked down into his eyes. 
And she said, I will not do any of the things you said. But I will ask you to do one thing. You must become my son. Come in. Come into this house. Sit down. I'll make you some food. And she fed him at the table where she'd always fed her son. He'd been running. He'd been hiding. He wasn't clothed properly. She took him to the bedroom where her son had stayed. She opened the closet. She said, you need clothes. Take some clothes. And he moved into her house and became a son to her. They learned to love and care for each other. They became a family. And God created something new to replace the guilt and the bitterness. And because of that situation, other people wanted to know what was happening and how did this happen and what's going on. And she began to tell them how God was working because, you see, the way to heaven was through the home of her enemy and her home turned out to be the home of her enemy. And God sent her across Rwanda to bring a healing touch to many, many people because she listened to God. She let him have his way and he used her not just to change her life and the life of a young man, but all kinds of people. Jesus meant it when he said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. He did it. He did it from the cross. He looked at those who had nailed him there, those who were making fun of him, those who, whose eyes were full of hate. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. These people are so messed up. They need your love. And he still hated today. There are people who hate Jesus. There are people who hate what he stands for. But he gives love back. He welcomes anyone to receive him. Anyone who's willing, he'll come into their life. No matter how badly they've treated him before, he loves them, and they're welcome. Jesus overcomes evil with good over and over again. And he uses people like us to do it. He helps us love the worst of these. He helps us pray for those who mistreat us. He helps us overcome evil. Forgiving someone who injures us does not mean tossing aside healthy boundaries. It doesn't mean allowing wrong things to continue to happen. It doesn't mean that we can cancel justice, although sometimes forgiveness involves that. It releases healing grace. When we forgive, when we give love, we release God's love. We release God's grace. We pass on the mercy that we need so desperately in our own lives. We pass it on to others who obviously need it desperately as well. And it sets us free to let God's love in and to let it go through and to see what he will do. And even those of us who have rebelled against him and defied his will more times than we can remember, we can be agents of mercy in this world. We can put people in God's hands and let him do what he sees fit. And we know that he'll do the right thing. And we know that he'll love Jonah hated it. He had enemies and God loved them. He said, God, I knew you would love them. I knew you would be good to them. He hated that. But he just needed to let God's love in a little more into his own heart because we all need it. So ask God to change your enemy into a friend. Ask God to overcome evil with good. Ask God to let his love in you so fully that it flows through you. And then our assignment this week, love the hurting and love the hurtful. 
Ask God to show you how to love everyone who comes into your life the way Jesus loves them. And let's let Jesus have his way when he says to us, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. I can't do that. I doubt if you can. Some of you are a lot nicer than me. I, I grant you that. But it takes God's love, doesn't it? It takes him being in charge. It takes us being available to him. And when we do, his power is released. Wow, that is, that's worth seeing. That's worth seeing. So let's be those people that say yes to Jesus. Maybe you've heard somebody say, don't ever pray for patience. Don't pray for patience, because how do you learn patience? If you pray for patience, God will send you problems. Don't do it. I think that's kind of a slander against God. If I pray for patience, it's because I trust God to be a good teacher. And I, I'll be honest with you, I 
looked at this sermon, I thought, I don't know if I want to preach that. I don't know if I want to be, I don't know if, who's the worst of these that's going to come along this week? I can't do it. I cannot do it. I cannot be patient. I cannot be loving. I cannot be godly unless God does it. And this sermon reminds us we need him. We need to be hooked to him. We need to be connected. We need to be intimately involved in knowing his heart. And so let's ask him to use us. And let's ask him to have his way. And let's trust him that it's a little scary for us, but it's not a challenge to him to show kindness. And whatever he does in our lives, when we get to the end, we will thank him. We will thank him for everything. I remember 30 years ago being at the bedside of a woman who was dying. And those were her last words that I heard. She said, thank you for everything. Her family was there. Thank you for everything. What a sweet, beautiful gift she gave those who loved her. But I believe she even said it more fully to her Father in heaven. Trust him. When it's hard, we need him. When we need him, he's there. Amen? Lord, we thank you that you're merciful and good to us.